Okay. Hi, um, Bobby, are you in the room still? I just wanted to challenge you and say that San Diego is an incredible design community. Um, I moved here 30 years ago, and frankly, our practice wouldn't be what it is today if we hadn't built it here. So I'm very proud of the city. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, so what is it to be civic? And we've been thinking about this a lot lately because we have this wonderful project that I want to show you at the end of this presentation. It's a very important moment, I think, in, in the life of cities. Uh, we have an opportunity in making places and spaces to really create uh, an environment where we can be together. And no matter what project we are working on, there is an overwhelming expression of that desire, of that need. We come together through social media, but how do we come together physically? So I have um, spent some time teaching at Stanford University recently, teaching a group of civil engineers about architecture. And the word design thinking is a big deal at that university. But I didn't really understand what it meant, because as an architect, it's not something we're typically exposed to. So I really thought about it in terms of our world. And I wanted to share with you the way we see it and the way we understand it. And that is primarily through process. And process is built over years and years and years of thinking, and we all know that. But how does that happen in our world? And how does that work towards building something civic? So early on, uh, I'm going to take you on a little journey very quickly through 30 years of practice and end up here, back here in San Diego. Um, at one of the most civic moments in our city's history. So in the beginning, I thought about doing big projects. And that's what architects do. You want to do towers. You want to do urbanism. You want to do things that really answer the needs of a culture. Um, and what happens is you start to understand, and maybe this is the case in your industry, the scale at which you should be working. And there are so many scales that are possible in the architectural realm. Um, so this is my first project, which is 30 years old. Um, we actually just pulled it out of the drawer, <laughs> the archive, for this talk. But it was um, a competition, which I won in 1985, to design the Center for Innovative Technology in Washington, DC, the first smart building in the United States and the first building to really take on the relationship between commerce and academia in terms of researching technology. How did I deal with it? I dealt with it by telling a story. And for me, I didn't know anything about technology. But the story was that technology was about research, and it was about innovation. And then, at the top here, you'll see a line of elements that you'll find strewn throughout the landscape. And those were little meditation huts for scientists. And they were based on tarot cards. So this idea of logic and poetics started to emerge pretty immediately through the work. And this is a rendition of one of the courtyards in the building where we actually worked with um, farmers in the community to understand why they had these globe, these, these reflective globes in their um, pastures. And the reason is it's to fend off evil spirits. So even in, the, in, in the, the sense of something very technological like farming, here is this really poetic response. Um, equally big, working in Austria on a very massive uh, project that cut a swath through the city and redefined it as an urban landscape. Beautiful narrative and idea, but in my, the back of my mind, something's missing about that. Some models we did of that project. And then working later at the World Trade Center, 
literally moments before um, what happened on 9-11, looking at how could we create a, a, a plaza in the World Trade Center that would bring people together. So we started looking at um, the lunar shifting of the moon, and we created this series of bowls that filled with water depending on the moment of the lunar um, cycle. So poetics and logic, again, this was the structural drawing for the World Trade Center originally. Just a, a, a just a, a confounding, amazing place. And then just inserting this really simple grid of lunar eclipses on top of it to say that logic and poetics make sense together. Then I started thinking about empathy. And this was really early on. How do we make space that feels what you feel? How do we make space that responds to how you feel? And how do we make space that makes you just literally feel good? And um, later in, in the life of our studio, we, we did a lot of work around this with Joan Greger and uh, Chuck Pelly and our friends at GE Healthcare to really understand how do we make space for um, health and health giving is the way I see it. But this image just struck me. I saw it in a gallery. A friend of mine was a curator. And this is all of it to me. This is the work of Rebecca Balmori. She's a Canadian First Nations photographer. Um, you feel her pain, her pain emotionally, physically, culturally. And how do we tap into that and make space that is respected of that feeling? And so the first building that I felt strongly about in terms of empathy is the Maison de Verre in Paris, which was built in 1931 for a gynecologist. And he invited his patients to come to his house uh, for consultations. And it, it's, it's really a study in the relationship between the delicacy of that gynecological relationship and the relationship of he to his community and to his family. It is the first use of um, glass block in architecture at such a scale, and um, many other materials as well that give it an amazing texture. Um, this is the site plan showing from the street. There's a courtyard. The house is set midpoint in the, the lot, and then there's a garden in the back. But this is the gyne gynecologist's office, this space of incredible intimacy and privacy and yet a sense of lightness and joy at the same time, something very different for that function. And then as the client would come in, they'd see this screened off stair to know that there's home there, there's a family there, there's a sensation of welcoming and being there that's very relevant and comforting. And then this is the main living spaces was one of of joy and commune. Many artists came here to um, have uh, salons and to discuss art, but it's a place of openness and um, modernism. And then at the very top of the building, there's an intimate space for the family to live. So architecture can provide that empathetic response to our needs as a culture. Research is a big part of doing the right thing as well and making civic space. And research is a huge part of our work. So we began working 15 plus years ago with Nissan, a product designer. And understanding the big difference between what it is to make a product and what it is to make a building. But the process being very, very similar. So here's the subject matter, the automobile. We didn't really understand how they made them. And so we did an exercise of researching the object. Let's call it an object. And we took this very stretchy material and we started 
creating sculptural form to understand how the automobile is carved. In, in the, that product world, it's reduced from a block of a whole. In architecture, we build by piece upon piece upon piece. So it's almost a, a reverse process. So we had a lot of fun just playing with them to understand what it is they do. But then we were asked to make a home for their process, for their design team. And so we did the research to look culturally to Japan. And Japan is known for wonderful renditions of packaging of intimate objects, some often things of daily use. And the thing that struck us the most was the one on the far right, which comes from a book called How to Wrap Five Eggs. And this is the way that you would bring your eggs home from the market. So elegant, celebratory, um, a beautiful design in its own right, as is the egg. And we thought, how can we make a space for Nissan's process that is that honorable and honoring their process? So we began looking at um, their process and understanding there's one moment in it that's really, really special. And that's the moment when, where the, the model of the car, the automobile, is brought into the sunlight for the first time and studied by people from all over the world that come to see it. And they had never really determined a beautiful space to do that within. So we started working on these forms and showing how that form might um, interact with the building itself. And really understanding that this notion of movement is very important, obviously, in the process, but in the process of looking as well. And so we developed um, a form that is a courtyard, and it's where the automobile is investigated. But here are all the other things that it adds to the life of a studio, and in a way being empathetic to those within. It brings natural light in, which never happens in an automotive studio. So you actually know what time of day it is, and your health and wellness is shifted for that simple, simple reason. It also provides a level of security. So when you bring the automobile out into the, into the world, you don't want everyone to see it. But you also want a sense of being in the world. So the, the structure is opaque at the bottom and translucent at the top. The building is set over underneath a no-fly zone. So we had to calculate the distance that a helicopter could hover away from the building to understand the angle that they could shoot a photograph to take a picture of next year's automotive um, wonder. So um, the whole project is logical, and it's based on this idea of really rational need, but at the same time, it has a poetic gesture connected to it. So we did all these very, very precise um, sun studies to understand how the space would be used. Um, there was a, a really wonderful process of the team observing the construction of the piece so that you know that actually a human hand is making this feat of engineering. And this is the finished product, um, which we worked very closely with a company out of Kansas City called A. Zaner. And there's an, a collaboration that happens as well, which brings a human aspect and scale to every project that we do. So the, the structure actually is 30 cantilevered columns with one side, inside and outside, um, sheathed with perforated metal. It glows in the sunlight. Uh, there is not one day when it is the same. So for the experience of a designer, it's something wonderful to come to work and wonder what it will be today. And that is another aspect of it that I think is sort of a, a, a human, a humane gift to the project. 
Um, design should always involve surprise. And this was our surprise of not really understanding that through the double layer of perforated and then the distance between them, we created this amazing moiré pattern. And it, it's also something that shifted depending on the light and the season. And so this is a building that is never quite the same ever once or twice. So here is now the automobile at home in its um, little egg, really. And I, this is one of my favorite photographs of our work ever um, because we didn't take it, nor did we have it taken. But uh, one of the designers at Nissan came to work one morning and found this surprise as well, with, which is the way that snow falls on the structure, and sent it to me saying, now I understand why you did what you did. We had a fight all the way to build this. We actually had to sell it as a marketing tool in order to get it built. But in the end, it became this uh, sentimental object that defined the spirit of the studio. So moving along in the process with, with them, we actually um, were invited to make another building for them. This time, uh, much later, uh, this is only uh, maybe uh, a few years ago, to talk about the digital process and how the digital process has entered their world from the world of ha the hand to the world of the digital. And so we began playing around with the digital, not that, that something that we don't often do, but it was fascinating. So we took a painting, Southern California, classic mid-century painting. We designed a table and we had the milling machine make that table for us. So we're, we're actually diving deep into understanding our user. And in this case, our user is a machine. So we had a little conversation with the machine. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, there's the machine. <laughs> So we started understanding how do we make a house for the machine? And I, we're really talking to the machine like it is a human being. And um, so we started looking at how do we sheathe it? How do we cover it? How do we protect it? Um, and ultimately, the, um, and how do we perhaps engage the machine in making its own skin? Which was a really, really interesting conversation. But here's the building. Um, we had zero budget. Uh, we made it out of Butler building parts, and we sheathed it with uh, a skin that identifies kind of the wonder of what the machine does within. It is not occupied by people. It is only occupied by the machine. It has a life of its own. But in a way, it's um, another sentimental spirit of the designer. And so it sort of sits in the courtyard of the design studio and glows. It glows knowledge, it glows collaboration, and in some ways it speaks to everyone in the studio. Storytelling is another big part of process. And I'm gonna go through this one really quickly because we only have a few minutes left, but this is uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. The image on the left is the Irving Gill House, and this is where I think design community really began in San Diego, um, the early 20th century. Um, the museum has engulfed that building now, but, um, and then this is the back side of the building today uh, with the Nancy Rubens <coughs> essentially hanging off the edge of it. So we were asked to create a boardroom table, and. No, normally, you would think of that as something made of walnut, um, dark, with these big, heavy chairs around it to connote seriousness. Well, we wanted to think about it in a different way, so research came to um, aid our process again. And we started looking at the philanthropy of the museum, uh, the collecting of the museum, its making of buildings, its diversity, 
um, how many artists were on its board, intimacy, and how does all that work to come up with a new solution? So in a very logical way, we looked at the accession plan for all the artworks that were purchased by the, um, by the museum. And here you can see a whole list of Robert Irwins, who's a local international artist uh, of the light and space movement in the mid-century. This is his work on display at the museum. There's an ethereal quality to it. And when I talk about our practice being of San Diego, this is what I'm talking about, this idea that light is so different here than anywhere else in the world. And that Robert Irwin has picked up on that and created these beautiful scrim sculptures that speak that language. And we wanted to celebrate that as a part of the table. So the table became a timeline. So from 1941 to 2008, and we're adding to it today as they create a new building and they have a new director. But basically, we set moments in the history of the museum that were important and marked them on the table. So it's a mapping of its history. And what better way to have a board meeting than to sit with your history and be proud of it? So this is the table in its room. It glows. It changes constantly. People have sort of intimate relationships with it. It's kind of strange. They touch it. They rub it. Some people get under it and look up. And it's, it's more than a table. It is uh, an object that defines the culture of the place. So here are some of the details. There's a hole in the table that represents two years when there was no director, no leadership, and it's for the you know electric cords. <laughs> <laughs> but finally, I'll go really quickly through this. This is a project that you, you know in your career when there's just that moment and you say, this is it, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I think for our studio, we're, we're all standing at the back. I mean, we would all agree this is the project. This is a project where we can design, think, we can research, we can be empathic, we can listen, we can storytell, we can narrate, we can be logical, and we can be poetic all at the same time. But it's also civic. It's at that scale again that where we started, but we're going to come at it in a different way because we've had all these other more intimate scaled relationships along the way. So it is a transformation of the Mingay International Museum which is in Balboa Park here. It is one of only two museums of its kind in the world, and we are just so lucky to have it in our community. Um, as the park changes, as we take automobiles out of the park, Menge is gonna have a whole new way of being. So you're gonna come across the bridge here, you're gonna turn right over another new bridge, and where will you land first in the park is at Menge. Menge is a museum of culture, and here we are at a moment where our culture is delicate, it's fragile, um, it needs help, it needs understanding, it needs compassion, and the collection at Menge is perfectly situated to help with that goal. Um, we do our historical research. The, the, the museum is set in a historical building from 1915. This is a really wonderful image we found. We still haven't figured out what these people are doing. Are they running away? Or are they joyous? We're, we're not exactly sure, but we're going to recreate this moment on opening day. Um, so the museum is based on the theoretical writings of this Japanese man who bemoaned the presence of industrialization and, and, and celebrated that which was made by hand. And I think that, and this was the first half of the 20th century, I think we're there again. Uh, we are celebrating technology and we are desiring things that we can touch. And so this civic place will be perfectly um, positioned to share that kind of thinking. So these, these are all moments in the collection. 160 countries are represented, all craft, design, and folk art. So 
the idea for us of making a house for the repository of all these wonderful cultural objects is just the most wonderful challenge of all. This is my favorite object in the collection, the tea whisk. I have one in my kitchen. I never realized it's made of one piece of bamboo that's been sliced hundreds of times. Just fantastic. Um, all the way up to the technology of making surfboards, the surfboard show. I don't know if you saw it last year. It was just one of the most successful. And so it's a very forward thinking museum as well. So I'm going to go through this super quickly, research about what is it to be a museum in the 21st century. It's something very different than it was. It is a place of gathering. It's a place of culture. It's a place of being social. That's why we want to go. So we are making a place to gather and a place to be together. And in that way, it will be incredibly humane. Um, we mapped all of the mission statements of the museum and then extended them out to all the possibilities of how space could possibly generate um, a respect and an honoring of that mission. We looked at really serious um, mappings of the relationship of their mission to our design thinking and to the typologies of museums today. So the museum sits between two landscapes, Alcazar Garden on the left and Plaza de Panama on the right, and we're just going to blow the museum open. It will be free to the public. It will be the living room of the park. It will invite you in to understand design, craft, and folk art, and it will be a social space. And so there's a plan showing um, how it will be a museum, a cafe, a bookstore, a library, an education center, all at once. Um, the section of the building, we, we looked at the history of the building. We found particularly the tower was a space that hadn't been occupied since 1915. And so we are going to place this beautiful stair in it and a Dale Chihuly sculpture that's a part of the collection but it will be a moment of celebration. Um, you're dealing with historicists. It's really, really interesting doing new architecture in that context. So we did find one part of the building that is non-historic, and that's the loading dock. And so we're inserting a really special piece there. Um, it'll be a civic theater. And so the whole community will use this space and then on top of it, we're adding a sculpture court. So we're actually adding landscape to a historic place. And so here's the theater, um, the sculpture court, sculpture court at night on movie night. We hope you come. And then finally, um, through the research of 1915 and the or origins of the building, we found some terraces that had also never been used. And so those are shown right here. Um, let me show you this photograph. So this is a celebration in 1915. And you can see these people up on the terrace. That's the only way we could convince the Historic Resources Board that we could do this project. And thanks to Anne in the office for finding that image. But now, we're going to open up those terraces to the public. You'll have a whole new way of experiencing one of the most historic parks in America. And, uh, and this, in a way, is about being civic, is, is gifting back to your community. And so the project is not purely architectural. It is, in fact, a gift of civicness, in a way, um, by the museum to the park, to the city, to the community, and to all the people who want to really understand this culture that we live in. So thank you so much. <laughs>